to call the conference committee back to order, folks. Uh, don't panic yet. Um, Senator Weber, thank you. Glad, good to see you this evening. Thank you, thank you sir. Uh, Chair Nelson, do you know if, Rep if Senator Jasinski is going to be joining us? I know the Transportation Conference Committee is done for the evening. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair, um, Chair Dabney. Uh, actually, he's also called into a leadership meeting, which was going to be at 6, but it got backed up. So he will be coming, but I don't know how long that uh, leadership meeting will be taking. Okay. So uh, I, I do want to uh, credit the, the Senate. Uh, while we were chatting about the lack of, of movement, uh, the Senate actually moved. Uh, particularly in the K-12 area, uh, offering $75 million more to your target, bringing it up to $286 million, uh, which I think the, the governor categorized as, I, I don't have the quote down, but as uh, an acknowledgement by your leadership uh, that they were underfunding education. Uh, Sen Senator? Uh, Chair, Chair Dappy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to just kind of set that comment aside okay. a moment. Um, and I do want to acknowledge the fact that uh, on Saturday, uh, when we were here, the we, um, Senate brought in two pages of SAMES and similar, mm -hmm. it's a document of two pages. Uh, we adopted about 90% of that. I thought it was a productive mm -hmm. session. And I think today started out as a productive session as well. And, you know, one of the challenges is leadership. Uh, has not set those global targets yet. And of course, we thought they were going to be here on um, May 6th. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's not one party's fault. Uh, we have divided government. Of course, that means there are big issues. And as I said earlier, there's about a $12 billion issue in tax increases between what the Senate proposes and what the uh, DFL proposes. But, you know, this is not a, a one-party fault. It's divided government. There's big issues. It's going to take some time for them to figure it out. Of course, we want them to, to figure it out sooner. But uh, because of the tardiness in the targets, which we thought would be coming on May 6th, um, you know, my original plan was to work in a totality. Uh, but looking at the timeline and the calendar, of course, I think we cannot wait for targets before we look at that whole package. And uh, that's why uh, we have framed up tonight um, and we are ready to frame up a non-controversial bill that looks at SAMES and similars that were in each body. So th things that were uh, both, bo both bodies address the issues and we might have some differences uh, with those. But however, what is not going to work, I just want to emphasize this, partisan attacks bullying and disrespect will not work towards being productive. And I want to be very clear that the Senate will not tolerate that type of uncivility. So if that continues, um, we will not be here. We will not be here. We will not be present for those type of partisan attacks. But if you are ready to work on things that um, are in both bills and we're ready to work and work towards as much as we can while we await for our leadership, and our leaders to come up with those joint budget targets. We are here, we're ready to go, and uh, we have in front of you um, a proposal for you uh, to consider. Uh, and we'll, if I could, you could, uh, we could turn that over to the Senate if you'd like to just have that proposal described. Well, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for that. Um, I do hope that the, uh, you know, one of the, the guidelines in, in my committee this year was respect, respect for Members, respect for staff, res respect for the public, respect for testifiers. I do hope to see uh, that reflected out of the Senate. Oh, as we go yes. forward, that would be uh, appreciated you as we go count. on. You can count on it, Chair. Uh, that would be refreshing. Um, I do think that uh, we've been devoid of partisan attacks so far. I hope that that continues. I do think the, the newspaper, uh, you know, the media, keeps us abreast. Uh, I do also hope uh, that you're not setting a standard for a small, weak bill that does not meet the aspirations of our students and their families, and does not meet the needs of employers, and does not meet the, uh, the requests of communities for services that will strengthen the communities, build opportunity for their youth, and set Minnesota on a on a path forward uh, that we can, I think, all aspire to. 
with that. Mayor Dabney, I'm not exactly sure what you said that, but said there, but we'll give you uh, some grace. Uh, we're ready to work, and uh, I think we should get forward with that. Uh, we should not be uh, trying to uh, frame one another's words nor ideas. That's something we don't allow on the Senate floor, uh, and I'm sure the House has similar provisions, mm -hmm. uh, not imputing uh, motives or any such thing. Uh, and I suggest that we uh, get to work, look at the um, a proposed adoption we have before us, but I will, re I will remind the chair that we will not be part of any partisan attacks uh, at all. So if that's where we're going to go, uh, we're going out the door. Well, if we're ready to work, we're ready to work. Um, I'm glad that the Senate has come ready to work. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. So, Madam Chair, uh, let's whoop, let's begin, go back to the uh, items for discussion, May 13th, 2 p.m. document. And we have uh, Article 3, Section 58 on the House side on page R47. Um, that's not in the proposal we brought you, sir, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. We brought you the proposal from 6.30 this evening. Yes. Did you not get a copy? No, I, I did, but uh, okay. Madam Chair, I would move Article 3, Section 58 on page R, uh, R47A3. Mr. Chair? This is, relates to uh, records of treatment of minors, and you'll recall this is the privacy protection for children who've been, experienced maltreatment. Mr. Chair? Senator are you, Nelson. Are you ignoring the proposal that the Senate worked on and brought to you this evening? Madam Chair, no. I was, well, first of all, we have a motion on the floor. So obviously we, we can't divert to some other set of proposals. We've, we'll have to dispense with this motion first. I was simply starting where we began today at 2 o'clock with uh, the 2 o'clock uh, work and then we can work through and as we come across those Senate uh, provisions, we can deal with those amendments at that time. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator. the Senate will be voting no on all of those provisions. All right. We have uh, provided you with, in fact, we spent a significant amount of time bringing back a um, proposed adoption for you um, and um, we you have the gavel, and so uh, you definitely will be able to uh, chair the committee as you wish. Right. Well, Senator, you just indicated that the Senate was here to work. I think you're right. With that, those in favor of adopting uh, Article 3, Section 58, please, uh, stick. please respond with aye. 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 Those opposed? No. No. Motion prevails. Division? Division. A division being called for. Those in favor of the motion, please signify uh, by raising your hands. Those opposed? Oh, my hearing is just not what I thought it was. Oh, that's All right. The motion does not prevail. <laughs> uh, I will now move uh, Article 3, Sections 45, 46, 47, 48, and 49. This responds or relates, excuse me, to grants to prepare American Indian teachers. So, Mr. Chair, I have an amendment. Senator Nelson. Uh, that would be the, uh, let me find it here, the A44 amendment. We'll start with that. Okay. Or the A43 amendment. A43. So, the, uh, for, for members in the public, the SCH 2400 A43 which amends the House language beginning on page 132, line 4, if I'm understanding that correctly. Why don't we give uh, folks a moment to find that so we all know what uh, we're talking about before we vote. Yeah, Mr. Chair, maybe we can have... Representative Joachim? Partisan staff walk through this because I'm Certainly. having a hard time because one of the notations is the, the note number and saying you're accepting language, but then the amendment goes to the Senate file. So I'm getting a little confused. Oh, so. perhaps you want to back up the uh, Senator Nelson, Mr. Chair. Um, the Senate does uh, accept. Uh, 
Oh, we'll, we'll wait. We'll, 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 okay. we'll, we'll, we've got a motion on what, the floor. We'll what, do that what's first. the clearest way to, to walk through the amendment and its oh, impact on the sure. language? Like Please. That? Um, actually, we had a, a pretty healthy discussion on this earlier this afternoon. Um, and this has to do with a priority uh, when awarding scholarships. Mm -hmm. The grantee institutions and the contracted partner institutions must give priority to those students who are progressing toward an associate of arts or a bachelor's degree. And then the second provision is that students progressing towards the master's or doctoral degree, if they were enrolled in the degree, degree granting program prior to May 1, 2019. And I believe we have that cleanup language uh, so, th so the provision has been uh, cleaned up a little bit from what we discussed to adopt the uh, Representative Pinto's uh, suggestions as well. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the Senate putting this together. I think if we were to move forward with the idea of prioritizing uh, associate and bachelor's recipients, then this seems like this would be appropriate language. I guess I'm... I'm um, I guess I'm still trying to understand, though, why, and my apologies, I think I may have come in in the middle of that discussion earlier, but just to understand why we would not give equal priority to students at whatever uh, level they're at. Um, and again, especially since I guess I'm still interested in any input that may have been received from our American Indian community regarding this, since this is, in fact, those teachers. Senator Nelson? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, perhaps the Senate, or the uh, Chair, would like to hold a recess so you could discuss this with uh, your members. Also get some further input if you like. That was really the genesis of the Senate proposal that we've put together to allow you and your members to go through, to take a look at this, uh, bring in uh, some, call some of those folks that you have some, uh, that you want to speak to about this. I think that's a good idea. Um, and um, if that was something the um, chair would like to do, I think that would be a Good use of time so you could go through those type of uh, initiatives with your uh, members. Mr. Chair. Senator, uh, Representative Pinto. I, I wonder if, Representative Erdahl. So I wonder if just in the meantime, though, could, could the Senate provide the reasoning for why we would prioritize those, um, those students at the associate or bachelor's level rather than encouraging the graduate studies? Um, just to sort of what the, what the justification would be for, for that. That so, would be helpful. So I, I think to Representative Joachim's comments yeah. earlier about uh, career changers sure. who might already have a bachelor's. Uh, sure, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Mr. Chair and Ms. Chair, I believe. Um, so the intent is to use funds uh, that are targeted to those who um, would not uh, likely be able to become involved in uh, teaching our students. We want to get more uh, teachers of color into our schools, into our teaching professions. And the, in, and the impetus is to, um, resources are always limited, to first priority, to prioritize those who are beginning that step in education preparation, which would be your Associate of Arts and your bachelor's degrees. We do know that there may be some there may be some career changers. Uh, and surely after we get more data, as we described in our, af in our afternoon session, uh, there may be a reason to do that. But right now, that was even, as I said, even one of the pieces in the 2017 Teachers of Color bill that, um, that the Senate put forth last year, uh, or in 2017, we are not really right now collecting the data so we know what works and what is really going to help us achieve our goal. So I believe uh, certainly um, Chair Yuakim's uh, position to, uh, to make sure that career changers are able to also go into the teaching profession with uh, grants from the state. I again believe our first priority is to get more, uh, to target resources to those who would not otherwise be able to uh, do that. And, Quite frankly, uh, when we come back and have some more data, it could very well be uh, that there are career changers, uh, changers who are who might be Im impacted by this. But at this point, we just don't know, and um, it's just a point to always uh, target resources to get the uh, biggest results uh, and to um, focus on students. And in this case, uh, get more uh, teachers of color into our schools. So we would be able to do so. Uh, 
funding at the associate and the bachelor's level, uh, the master's and the doctorate level are certainly more expensive courses, but we also think that someone who is pursuing a doctorate degree, doctorate degree may have the ability to have some skin in the game to help them go back to school for uh, education preparation. Representative Pinto. Thank you, just briefly, I wonder if maybe it would make some sense then to prioritize those who are new to teaching and then sort of whatever level they're at if, that, if that's the goal. I know there's some other folks with hands up, so that might be something for us to consider. Representative Erdahl. Uh, a couple of things, first to point out uh, something that might be helpful, there is a $2,500 tax credit for teachers getting their master's degrees in their content areas, mm -hmm. so that may be helpful. And secondly, uh, if you haven't uh, noticed in your, your email uh, thus far, uh, Ms. Snyder did a fine job and has uh, already got to us uh, some of the, uh, the grant recipient amounts that we asked about earlier. So, Representative Erdahl, just to, to clarify regarding the tax credit, that wouldn't help someone with an undergraduate degree who chose then to go into teaching because that wouldn't be in their licensure area because they wouldn't have a license yet. Am I understanding no. that correctly? Because uh, education is not considered a licensure area. Right. It would be someone who has a license, uh, has a degree, and is getting a master's degree in what they teach in their content area. Thank you. Uh, Representative Joachim. Um, well, just to throw something out there, too, to see if we're going to end up, you know, not a big fan of prioritizing when I do can worry about wanting to have people wanting to come in new into teaching if they already have a bachelor's it would not make sense for them to get another bachelor's it'd actually be cheaper in some cases if you're going into it I looked into this when I was looking into special education to actually get the master's instead of going back and getting a full bachelor's again to actually teach so that is my major concern um, but if you really want to prioritize, maybe we should be prioritizing with a bachelor's, associates, and then the graduate degree, um, because we really do want our teachers to be um, fully trained in a four-year program, if is preferable. But my major concern, like I said, was for teachers coming in out of the field that are yes. have changed their passion and really want to, and really, and since we're actively trying to recruit teachers of color. If they come in with a bachelor's and another degree, it actually, in some cases, is cheaper to get your master's in teaching above and beyond that bachelor's than it would be to go back and get a whole other bachelor's. So you're actually putting more monetary barriers in front of them. So, Senator, is, is it the Senate's intention to close the door on indigenous people wanting to go into principalships and in education leadership? The principal, the uh, Senate position is to get as many teachers of color in the classroom as possible. I do want to remind members, it's, uh, we didn't exactly get to discuss that, uh, but the uh, Senate conference committee um, proposal to the House members already includes, and maybe you haven't had a chance to look at that sheet yet, but I do want to make sure you have that in front of you, um, already includes adopting House sections 45, 46, 47 and 48 of the House language and adding on the one Senate provision, which is section 49. So I do want to make clear that um, all of those House provisions um, in your in the previous language, uh, sections 45, 46, 47 and 48 are being proposed for adoption. The Senate is only um, asking that in return that we see uh, Section 49 adopted of the Senate proposal uh, on this particular topic. So, Madam Chair, do you, do you simply want to move that we, just to move things along expeditiously, we adopt 45, 46, 47, and 48? That was the Senate proposal that's in front of you. I'm saying just, just those, and then we can focus in our conversation on uh, Section 49. Uh, that is fine. Okay. Uh, with that, to clarify for members, uh, Senator Nelson's motion is to adopt uh, Article 3, Sections 45, 46, 47, and 48 of the House bill. With that, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Joachim, uh, d and Senator Nelson moves yes. the A43 amendment. 
Is that correct? Which I believe we already had on the table. Yeah, but well, then we moved over to the <laughs> one we just did. And right, so I'm just right. making sure yes. we've got the, the Legos all in the right row. And Representative Joachim. Thank oh. you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to point out, just, I, just so I'm reading this right, all those sections we adopted were actually the exact same language, except for one sentence. So why I appreciate the movement toward the House language, um, just having 133.1 and 133.2 being different, I just wanted to point that out. Plus, there's a change in the amendment, and maybe it's just technical, or maybe nonpartisan staff can look at it for me. In the amendment um, on line 132, page 132, line 4, it reinstates the stricken scholarships and then deletes grants. Is that more of just a technical change or on, on the section that we just adopted? Mr. Arneson. Mr. Arneson. <clears throat> uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chair and members. I believe that it's fairly characterized as a technical change because elsewhere in the House language, the, these awards to students are referred to as scholarships. And it, I, I think it probably was just um, an oversight in drafting um, in Subdivision 4. Representative Joachim. I, I Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I actually stand corrected looking back at this language. Um, it wasn't even a sentence different. Sections 45 through 48 is exactly the same in the Senate and the House that we just adopted. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I guess I'm wondering whether Senator Nelson would consider it a friendly, a friendly amendment potentially. Um, I, I guess I'm really taken with the idea that we're trying to encourage folks who are new to the classroom. And so that it seems like that's maybe more the priority than the pre than precise degree. So I wonder if, if um, uh, in place of the language here in the amendment, if it would be the uh, must give priority to students uh, who are n new to teaching. I want to make sure that I be careful with the language, but, uh, but if uh, a senator, I'm sure, understands the um, the intent anyway. And I just wonder, would wonder if that might be kind of get at what we're trying to achieve. Senator Nelson? Uh, Chair Pinto uh, and Chair Dabney, that does get to the, um, to the, to the genesis of the Senate language, but um, we will definitely want to, to further discuss this. And um, again, uh, this was the, and there were a few other technical um, uh, changes uh, in those uh, articles that we adopt also of the House language, but this was a very important provision to the Senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be glad to take that under advisement, uh, Chair Pinto, particularly if um, you want to put that in some sort of an amendment form so we can make sure and look at your language and see how that might impact. I will note that um, I appreciate the information that we already got from the Minnesota Department of Education about the Minnesota Indian uh, Teacher Training Program. I think that's um, uh, how helpful. And I also have some information also from the department uh, regarding the um, Minnesota Indian Teacher Training Program. Uh, and just to point to that fact that we need better data, which we have talked about before, and. Uh, and I, and I point to my own legislation in that matter, too, needing more data. Uh, of the 134 uh, participants uh, in that Minnesota Indian Teacher Training Program, and let us say there should be more, we'd like to see more, especially as we think of uh, other things that have been in existence long before the 2017 Teacher of Color Program, like the Ethel Murray Scholarships. But of the 134 participants, currently uh, only 47 have files at Pelsby. So we really do need to uh, do a better job of uh, watching this data and make sure that what we think we're doing, uh, we're actually getting. So I, want to, uh, I would be glad to uh, take a look at uh, Chair Pinto's amendment, if he can get that drafted up and see how that uh, might impact the goal of getting more uh, teachers of color, particularly American Indian teachers, uh, into our classrooms. If that's helpful, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to work on that if that would be, would be helpful. I don't want to slow things down, but if it would be a helpful thing, then I certainly could do that. So am I understanding that you've, Senator Nelson, that you've withdrawn the A43 to allow Representative Pinto to come up with an amendment to the amendment and for us to deliberate on that a little bit further? Yes, and I'll want, right. to, uh, Thank you. I'll want to deliberate on that with uh, the, the full team as soon as we get. Of course. Uh, one of our other members here. Thank okay, you. so uh, for the record, uh, Senator Nelson withdraws the A43 amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, 
moving on then, uh, hoping we can, we can continue to find uh, areas of agreement. Uh, if we go to Article 8, Sections 3 and 5, these uh, relate to the ongoing voluntary pre-kindergarten program. We're looking at pages R8, no wait, R1, excuse me, and R3. So let's start with R1 in Article 8. And R1, uh, Section 3, oh, this is uh, the age appropriate, which kind of surprised me that this isn't already the expectation. Uh, Representative Pinto? Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would move um, adoption of the uh, Section 3 of Article 8 from the House version is simply um, making sure that we do, in fact, have age-appropriate versions from the state-approved menu of uh, kindergarten entry, entry profile measures. All right. Thank you very much. Discussion to the uh, Pinto motion. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair Davney. Um, again, uh, the Senate uh, conferees did not go over this language. Uh, we spent our time going over language in the uh, proposal for adoption that we provided to you. So uh, the Senate is not prepared, uh, especially without all of our members here, and not having gone through the provisions here uh, to, to accept this language. And again, if we, ch if we want to move forward uh, without, uh, in a respectful manner, uh, I would suggest that uh, the, um, the House look at the proposal by the Senate uh, and simply say yes or no. I, I can understand why you might want to recess with your members to talk about these things. But uh, the Senate is not prepared uh, to make these decisions without having uh, had the um, full um, conference with the Senate. And we had not intended that tonight. Uh, the, what we have is, a, is an adoption for you. These are the positions that we were able to uh, walk through get to that uh, position where language is in both bills, non-controversial, uh, and without significant changes. So that is the proposal that we have before you tonight that we delivered at 6.30. Um, and again, the Senate is here uh, willing to um, work on these proposals. However, we are not uh, adopting new language that has not been in uh, the Senate bill uh, without uh, further conference on that. Well, uh, Madam Chair, I, uh, I can certainly understand wanting to have your full complement review these. Will we be seeing Senator Jasinski tonight so that you Well, can... we're not sure what time, but we definitely would like to. Yeah. But I think more important than that, Mr. Chair, uh, truly, I think, uh, quite frankly, I think it's uh, disrespectful of the work that the Senate did during the, during the uh, recess to not look at those provisions that have been well <laughs> Uh, documented and conferenced with the Senate members, all of them, uh, and uh, to look at whether or not, I mean, I, I'd suggest you take a look at what we know we can do mm -hmm. and do that, not knowing how the House will vote. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. may vote mm -hmm. differently, definitely, uh, but I think it's important to look at those provisions in uh, the four articles that we have, uh, one, two, three, four, five, it looks like seven different provisions, uh, more uh, as you look at the different sections that are being adopted within those provisions, um, and act on those. Let's do something we can do tonight. Let's use our time wisely. Uh, and uh, now, if you need to conference with your folks on these mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, proposals, I definitely understand. But uh, the Senate um, is ready to, um, to hear the House's um, acceptance or not of these, of these proposals. Well, uh, Madam Chair, we, we'd hoped by reviewing all of these provisions earlier today, uh, same, similars, very similars, I think, in your language, awfully close to similars, uh, however we, we characterize them, that we would be able to move through the full agenda tonight, recognizing that there's times that things have to be set aside, but. Uh, we're not uh, proposing that we so narrowly target the committee's work uh, to just these few provisions that your, your side has come back with. We thought we had some good momentum coming in off of Saturday that we could 
get some substantive work done this evening uh, on, a, on an array of issues throughout the bill. Um, and that was our hope today. That was our, you know, aspirational, again, as, as the House seems to be routinely. So, uh, yeah, so Mr. Chair. Senator Nelson. Even on Saturday, uh, we listened to the House and set aside provisions that mm -hmm. we thought were same and similar that did not want to be acted upon. Uh, but tonight, uh, again, uh, y you are ignoring uh, what we have prepared and instead insisting upon going through provisions that are only in one bill. Uh, and that is not uh, the intent at this point. So at this point, the intent is to look at these uh, provisions that we have discussed, we have a full complement on, and, um, and a mixture, by the way, if uh, one took the time to look at all of the um, articles here, it's a two pages of articles that we have uh, looked at, uh, and um, you'll see there's a about an even split, actually, between Senate language and House language, maybe a little bit more on the House language. But again, our point is to um, act on those things that uh, are not controversial, that we can, that are in both <coughs> bills, and that should be our starting point. <laughs> our starting point should be looking at those things that are in both bills, that, and one body, uh, each body has an opportunity to look and to discuss. And that's exactly uh, what we brought to you this evening. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, um, we just want to. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a sign for that. The, I, maybe that is. Maybe that oh, yeah. is. I... That is like the first. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, you want to you give the senator a little help here? Yeah. This is why we need to vote for the House. Yeah, if the senator would like to provide votes for a new... Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> worked out so well. I'm so pleased with the new chairs this year. We didn't think about the microphone. I the top part of this, but... Uh, there you go. I, I think the Science Museum has one of their uh, exhibits includes uh, testing your reaction time, and it's it's like a yardstick that drops, and you you see how quickly you can you can grab it. It's yes. it's very similar here in the Minnesota House. I believe so. <laughs> um, so maybe what we need to do is get clarity from the Senate as to what work you wish to set aside and not engage on tonight, and then and then we can recess. That will give us an opportunity to review the amendments that you've proposed. If you wish before that recess to explain any of them, so we've got a, a full and rich appreciation, uh, that might be helpful, or we can just you know recess and, and consider them as as written, uh, and then return at a at a time that allows us to continue to work. Mr. Chair, Senator um, Nelson, I do believe that uh, it would be uh, valuable for the Senate to talk about the um, proposals that we have in front of you. I also think it might be a good use of time, since we don't have uh, Senator Jasinski back yet, that that might be a good time also for the for the House to recess and talk about these. But I am more than happy to uh, address these now. Uh, but if you would, uh, I, you know, you're. So, we'll walk through. We, Senator we Nelson, walk through these right before now. we do that, mm -hmm. would you please identify for us what elements uh, that we reviewed this afternoon that you wish to set aside? Um, Mr. So Chair. Clarity is a good thing, oh, I yes, think. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mr. Chair, uh, we did that, and we have for you the ones that we do not believe need to be set aside. That is in the... Um, uh, the proposal that we brought to you at 6.30 uh, this evening. Uh, and those are the ones that uh, we have gone through. And, uh, and Senator Jasinski was there as well. So all of the senators have gone through. Um, we spent a, a, all the time actually going through those proposals, picking out those ones that we believe can and could easily be adopted in, yeah. in short order. But we'll be glad to have uh, Mr. Artisan go through them if you choose. Well, let's just for clarity's sake, uh, let's go through. So the Senate wishes to set aside House Article 8, Section 3, House Article 8, Section 5, House Article 8, Sections 12 and 13. I'm making, wanting to go slowly enough to make sure that uh, we're all tracking along. 
House Article 7, no? No, you, do you have an amendment for Article 7, Section 1? Yes. You do, okay, so not that. Uh, Article 5, Section 4, Article 5, Section 5. You have, you don't have anything on your own language regarding yeah, floor plans? Mr. Chair, yeah, and yeah, I'll tell you why that was. Uh, because again, uh, the, the goal and the purpose of the Senate was to take those articles mm -hmm. that both bodies had addressed mm -hmm. in some way. Okay. Not exactly the same, but in some way. Mm -hmm. And so that is okay. why uh, the school floor plans has been set aside. Okay. So the point is, let's do the, the easiest stuff first, uh, which is, let's look at those things that both bodies mm -hmm. discussed, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is the proposal that we brought okay. for you, you so, today. Thank you for that clarification. Then again, uh, the Senate wishes to set aside House Article 6, Section 4, House Article 6, there's not a section number for the Notice of Environmental Hazards. Senator and again, Mr. Chair, that oh, was a, it's a Senate, Senate provision of course. that was uh, not addressed so in the So Senate House. Section 6, Article 3. House Section 6, or excuse me, Article 6, Section 5. I think that's on your list, Mr. That's Chair. on the list, okay. Then flipping the page, uh, the Senate wishes to set aside House Article 1, Section 5, Article 1, Section 6, Article 1, excuse me, Article 3, Section 4, 5, 6, stop me if I'm going too fast, Article 7, Section 7, Section 8, Section 9, Section 10, Section 12, Section 13, Section 14, Section 15. No, excuse me. Whoop, okay, uh, on that's your why. Sheet, you will see uh, Article 3, Section 14 is on your proposal sheet. Okay, thank you. Uh, but Article 15, or Section 15 is not, correct? Uh, let's see, 15, 16, and 17, and 18 are a block, and um, those are in your proposal as well, as so are, Section 19. So uh, I'm not understanding your, your language, Senator Nelson. Are okay. those articles, are those sections you wish to set aside? No, those or are they're in the amendment relating to Article 3, Section 14? Uh, those are on the um, proposal that we delivered to you at ah. 6.30 tonight, along with perhaps uh, one other amendment okay. that you haven't so, addressed yet. So we will be considering those tonight? Yes. That okay, and that's through 18? Uh, and through 19, through 19. amendment. Okay, mm -hmm. and then... Article 3, Section 20, set aside, 22, 26, 33, 34, and 35. A 34 has a fiscal note. Hmm. Okay. And then finishing up here, um, how do you, uh, what, what's your wishes on Article 4, Section 2? Since it, um, it is in both, and that's been yes. a bit of the criteria yes. here. And so uh, you'll see on your proposal sheet, uh, that is the Senate language, Article 4, Section 1. And that's, uh, that's for discussion tonight? Yes, that's okay. on your you. um, adoption uh, that we gave to you. And then setting aside House Articles 4, Section 16, and 18. No. Uh, House Article 4, Section 18, the Senate on your proposal has adopted house language, is sending you house language. Okay, for consideration later this mm -hmm. evening. All right, so now that we've got clarity on that, that was helpful, thank you, Senator. Uh, why don't you, we've got three, well, do you wanna take these article by article on the, the document that the Senate has provided? Oh, Mr. Chair, I think Senator. that's uh, certainly um, your prerogative. Mm -hmm. If your members feel comfortable going article by article and adopting or section by section, that's fine. If you feel that they need more discussion, of course, you'll have that ability. Uh, that. Let, let me rephrase. The, the, the yeah. question I meant to ask mm -hmm. was, do you wish to discuss these article by article before the House recesses to consider them? Yes. Yes. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Nelson, why don't you take it away? Mr. With Mr. Article Chair? 3. Oh, I, Representative I, Pinto. I think oh, I might have to withdraw the motion that, that had been on the table earlier. That's why okay. I, I do with so withdraw it. Thank you. So wh whatever Representative Pinto had moved has now been withdrawn. Thank you, sir. Representative Joachim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a clarifying question just so I understand. So 
Um, is it my understanding then you don't want to talk about any provisions we have that are in your bill only or our bill only tonight? Sir Nelson, I believe that was stressed. To you. Uh, I'm sorry, I was hearing a couple of Certainly. Uh, Chair Reverend Joachim? Joachim? Um, Madam Chair, I'm trying to understand exactly what your criteria are tonight. From what I'm hearing you say is that you don't even want to discuss provisions of the Senate file that are not in the House file that we may be willing to take. Senator Nelson. Uh, Chair Yukim, I think what we're seeing here, and we're just starting to see it a little bit, is, you know, the Senate had a very um, bill, a bill focused on uh, living within the current budget that we have. And it was a much smaller bill in many ways uh, than the House bill. Of course, as I said, we have half as many members as well. But the House bill, uh, as you've described it yourself and others, you know, it's an aspirational bill and you have a lot of things in there. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, a lot of policy, a lot of finance, many, many things. The Senate bill is uh, much more focused um, on um, really those uh, financial items. We also have some policy as well. Not nearly as much as the House, however, but you know, next year is a policy year. Uh, and this year, of course, the focus is on that budget uh, that we are waiting for. So to your question, Chair Joachim, uh, the Senate uh, proposal that uh, we delivered tonight uh, was just that. It, were, it was um, the first crack at those things that are in both bodies. Both bodies had hearings on them. They both are in the omnibus bill. And uh, they are not controversial or waiting upon budget targets. They are those, what we, what we would call the low-hanging fruit, those things that we should be able to do and that uh, we should be able to do rather quickly. But already we've almost spent an hour here and uh, we haven't quite got to that point yet. But that was the intention. And what I don't know is how comfortable House members feel about um, adopting provisions from a uh, proposal uh, with or without conversation uh, as as your House members. And of course, uh, Chair Dabney certainly um, knows his House members better and that their comfort level in adopting uh, the, or not, uh, the Senate uh, proposal that we brought before you uh, tonight at 630. Um, but again, yes, we were very consistent, Chair Joachim. We did not even put in our own proposals, which the House, did not have in the omnibus bill. So we are very consistent in that, in looking for those things that we know uh, both bodies discussed, we thought would be uh, easy things, that there may be a few little things uh, that are different. So we couldn't really call them uh, necessarily sames or technicals. Uh, these are smaller items, provisions that differed in each uh, body, but each was addressed, each of the uh, Provisions in the Senate proposal that we brought for adoption tonight to offer to the House uh, were in both bodies. Mr. Chair? Representative Yukin. Thank you, Madam Chair. It gives me a little bit more insight into um, your approach. Um, what I will say, though, is that we're willing to look at the committee process that you went through, lengthy hearings, just like we did. We happen to have both a policy committee and a finance committee, so that's maybe why you're seeing more policy language. Um, what we put on our sheet, we're very comfortable discussing tonight. I think that that's where the discussion should be, is at this table. And we were very comfortable talking about the few provisions that you had that we didn't, because we know you hashed them out. I'm just having some consternation or maybe question around not being able to even have a discussion at the table on, for example, Article 8, Section 3, where the only language we're changing is from others to other age-appropriate versions. So we picked very carefully things on our sheet, too, that we didn't deem controversial, that were either in your language or our language, so we could have that discussion here tonight and maybe make a little bit more headway past just same on the sheet, because we got a lot of work to do before Monday. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Chair Dabney, uh, to that point, we do have Mr. Arneson that is ready to go through those uh, provisions that you had asked that we go through article by article. Mm -hmm. And um, okay. when you're ready, you can call on him and we're ready to go. Mr. Arneson. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, if members are looking at the document from the Senate titled Items Proposed by Senate for Adoption, 
and dated uh, today. The first item on that list is in Article 3 on page R8, R3, uh, R, excuse me, R8 of Article 3. And it's a, uh, a section amending a reading strategy subdivision. And the, sec the subdivision is amended in both bills in somewhat different ways. And the Senate proposes to adopt the Senate, uh, the Senate section four on page R8. And uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this is a uh, Senator Clausen bill. Uh, and um, again, this, the offer to, this, to the House is to adopt Senate section four. And just to, to clarify, Mr. Arneson or, or Senator Nelson, that's uh, line 63.1 through 63, 64.3 of the Senate bill. Am I correct? All right. Thank you. Mr. Senator, uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually have a substantive question about this, if this is, <laughs> if that's inappropriate. Okay. Please. To the chairs. Let's um, try. We'll give it a try. Um, I believe it's coming up a little bit later, but we had discussed this maybe earlier today about the, the lunch shaming issue, and the Senate had made the point that the House has a version that spells out a number of, of uh, great detail about making sure that the districts are, are conducting themselves in a certain way so as not to shame children, and the, and the Senate has a more general statement of purpose, and there's some discussion. We'll get to that. I guess I view this as being the exact opposite situation, where a question that I would have is, is it both necessary and appropriate to lay out this level of detail about exactly what the dyslexia instruction needs to be and based on the pra practice standards of the International Dyslexia Association, et cetera, as opposed to simply having the broader statement uh, and establishing that more general foundation as opposed to all these details? It feels like sort of the opposite discussion as the lunch shaming discussion as earlier, and so I'm curious about the response to that. Senator Nelson? Oh, thank you, uh, Chair Davney and Chair Pinto. Uh, this is not uh, on school districts. This is our teacher prep programs. Right. So these are teacher prep programs, and uh, it is essential if we are going to make any kind of a dent in our literacy numbers, and if we want to close the achievement gap, the number one thing uh, that would be incredibly beneficial is making sure that our earliest learners um, receive effective reading instruction. And uh, I'm open for other questions. Thank you, Madam. Representative Pinto? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess I'm not at all doubting the, the need to have uh, programs have, the, have this kind of instruction in general. I'm just trying to understand the need to lay out in, in, at quite this level of detail uh, for those programs. Representative Joachim. Yes, and um, my, Madam Chair, this is language that, you know, our section in 14 only changes college and universities to preparation providers. You had, a, you had a whole nother level about dyslexia, which is a totally different direction. So this is actually language we don't have anywhere near in our bill, unless you want to talk about um, some of our other dyslexia provisions. We could probably have a, uh, a more robust discussion about that. Madam, uh, Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the language is the same except for uh, paragraph C. And uh, oh, excuse me, and also it, it does speak uh, up in uh, paragraph B about evidence-based and structured reading. Uh, well, quite frankly, we're at a crisis point when it comes to reading instruction for our students. Uh, we do not, uh, it looks like um, according to the latest numbers, it'll be uh, 2040 before all of the English uh, language art standards for multi-tiered uh, levels of support are adopted. Um, and also, in, in, to your question particularly about why is there this uh, specific language about dyslexia? One out of, um, uh, excuse me, 20% of our kids, one out of five, um, are dyslexic. One out of five. A significant amount, but what's interesting about this uh, evidence-based structured uh, reading uh, instruction is it is the type of instruction where students with dyslexia do very well, but it also uh, works uh, for for kids who don't have dyslexia. So again, um, it's looking at you know how long are we going to sit by and graduate kids that can't read. 
How long are we going to see kids being referred into special education because they haven't had a programmatic, structured, evidence-based reading uh, curriculum? And we know that uh, it's up to our teacher prep programs to do that. And so we, it is very specific, but we are at a very uh, specific and uh, dangerous time when our um, reading our uh, reading rates are so low. Mr. Chair. Representative Yukim. Madam Chair, I could not agree with you more that we're at a crisis point, but I think the crisis point actually starts in our schools with our kids and screening as well. So if we were going to look at this language, I would also strongly suggest we look at Article 2, Section 58, because then that would be a great balance. First, you're talking about making sure teachers are prepared to, to, to catch this, and they know how to address it. But in our language in Article 2, Section 58, it actually talks about screening children. Oh, sorry, Article 2, Section 8. It actually talks about a screening children, um, K through 2nd if they're having trouble reading, so we can catch them in time to see if they have dyslexia. So it'd be a great pairing between the two, making sure our teachers are prepared to teach, but also making sure we're screening our children so that we know where the problems and issues are at so that we can target that. Senator Justinski, welcome. Uh, just to, to orient you, sir, we've had some debate and discussion here. We're, we're working off of this document. I hope you have a, have a copy. Uh, and. Uh, the intent is to understand the Senate position for the House to recess, consider, and then return. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, Senator Eichhorn has updated me when I walked in, so thank you, and I apologize for that leadership, and just got done, so thank you. I, any updates? I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't come completely together yet. Not quite. Just, we're, Not quite. But, but getting closer. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. Good to hear. Well, it depends on who you ask. But yeah. <laughs> uh, that, I, I could see that. Thank you, sir. Um, do we want to uh, move on to the next portion of your provision? How sections 15 to 19, uh, the second bullet. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the next bullet is on page R9 of Article 3. And this is a, a series of House sections, um, some of which also appear in the Senate um, side. And um, the Senate is proposing to adopt House Sections 15 to 19 as amended by the A44 Amendment. Uh, and can you uh, help us understand how the A44 affects that language, please? Ah, Ms. Hofer. Yes, of course, finance provision. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, so the A44 amendment does essentially two things. So the first I would categorize as more of a technical amendment, and the second would be more of a policy decision for the conference committee. Uh, so the first more technical portion would be on lines 1.4 through 1.8 of the A44 amendment. Uh, so what this does is, if you're on the side-by-side, -side, page R10, on the House side, line 112, Point three, this would insert two additional sentences that essentially help with accounting for background check fees. So the first sentence of the A44 amendment uh, would direct Pelsby to deposit any payments received into an account in the special revenue fund. This is in keeping with current law, uh, though there isn't um, any direction for them to deposit those funds anywhere. It just says that they may um, collect the payment. And then the second sentence uh, would annually appropriate those fees that are collected to Pelsby so they could um, pay for the background checks themselves because that language doesn't exist. So this is essentially creating the legal authority for Pelsby to accept and then deposit and then pay for the background checks. And the second amendment on line 1.9 of the A44 uh, deletes may and inserts must. And on the side-by-side, -side, that's page R10, line 112.18. So this would require that Pelsby must contract with the Department of Human Services to conduct background checks. Thank you. All right. Questions for the, regarding the amendment, uh, Representative Joachim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then, so with that made to must, does that mean, does that preempt them from also contracting 
with the BCA if necessary? Because I think that what I heard earlier that they wanted to do, you know, sometimes it might be better with DHS. And, you know, I know Alex, uh, Mr. Leutz, he still is here if we need technical assistance on that. Senator Nelson? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, they could do um, more, but they could not do less. And maybe we could have our oh. uh, council further elaborate on that if necessary. Um, Mr. Chair, yeah. members, it's requiring the uh, Pelsby to contract with the Commission of Human Services um, instead of, I guess, making it an option by um, substituting the may for the must. All right. Mr. Luizzi, can you help us out on this from an implementation perspective? I can, Mr. Welcome. Chair. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the uh, background check that happens through DHS actually goes through the BCA. So yeah. both are covered under this, mm -hmm. and the must would be wonderful. OK. Thank you, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Arneson, I think it's back to you at that, this point to the third bullet under Article 3. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I believe this has already been the subject of some discussion in the committee. Uh, this is relating to the American Indian Teacher Preparation Grants. And ah. we looked at the 843 amendment already, but if there are further questions on that, I'd be glad okay. to answer. Any further questions regarding the A43 amendment from members on, uh, from either side? All right. And then, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, that Senator amendment, Nelson. Uh, that amendment was withdrawn. Is it going to work? Out? The A43. Um, oh. But I'm glad to reoffer it. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. We had some discussion. The amendment was out there. We had a lot of discussion. Yeah, 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 okay. I just want to make sure that uh, I am more than willing to offer this uh, amendment again if, in fact, the House is uh, prepared to move on that. So at this time, there are no motions in front of the committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Maybe Mr. Uh, Representative Pinto. And I'm not going to make one. I'm just going to clarify. <laughs> I believe that House Sections 45 to 48 have been adopted. So this is about House Section 45. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yes, I'm trying to work with uh, staff. And hopefully when we, we come back, we could have some, some, uh, some language for the Senate to look at um, that would amend uh, proposed amendment A43. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Arneson, Article 4. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, the next item on the list is an Article 4, and it begins on the first page of that article. This is a section uh, amended in both the House and Senate bills uh, in somewhat different ways and in kind of kind of three chunks. Um, so the, uh, on, pa on page R2, A4, the, the, on both sides, the first section of um, new language is kind of a distinct idea. On page R3, the middle chunk is a distinct idea. And the bottom of page R3, the last chunk um, in paragraph D is uh, a, a third idea. And the Senate recommendation is to adopt the Senate language. Uh, Mr. Anderson, can you help me find the middle piece that you saw as a distinct? Oh, uh, Mr. Chair, give me a site? Um, just the, the House amendments in paragraph C, I think, are, are kind of separate from the amendments in paragraph um, B and in paragraph D. So, how is section 15? Ms. Para? All right. So, oh, Representative Yu Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, just so I could understand this right, yeah, I'm looking at you're saying you want to take the Senate language for Section 1, um, but then that would leave out, just so I understand, um, the short term objectives. It would leave out allowing paras to actually see an IEP before working with a student with disabilities. And it would leave out all the training that we're asking um, for parents to have to be able to work with these students. And then also, um, unless I'm jumping ahead, because it looks like it's all the same section, um, under D, that is actually language 
um, for the functional behavioral assessments as standalone evaluation, um, which is a big part of um, <coughs> the new OM project and almost has exact language in yours too. Okay, so we're just leaving out as parent may request a school district. You, you require a parent being able to ask to do, to do the FBA differently, which I just wanna make sure I understand the differences. So you're taking out the short-term objectives, you're taking out paras being able to see the IEPs of students with disabilities and ask teachers to make sure they're working with kids that are highly vulnerable that they understand what their specific needs are, and then you're also taking out all the training for paras that we have in our in that section. Yep. Certainly. Yep. yep. So uh, you've identified the differences uh, correctly, Chair Joachim. Uh First, uh, the differences uh, have to do with uh, uh, pacer. So the parents of uh, children with uh, disabilities are again do not support the house language. Uh, however, they do support. Uh, the Senate language, which uh, does not include the language, eliminate benchmarks or short-term objectives. Uh, the two in the middle that uh, you mentioned, Chair Joachim, both have dollars attached. And as I said, uh, we are not addressing dollars until we have real budget targets. Uh, and then the last one as well, uh, Senator Joachim, again, it's the same language as what the House has in uh, par uh, paragraph D. However, uh, PACER, uh, again, these are the parents of the children that we're speaking of here, uh, particularly requested that um, a parent may request a school district to conduct a comprehensive evaluation. So we did not want to uh, remove that option from parents. They do not have to, but out of deference to those parents and their children, uh, that is an option for the parents to request a school district to conduct a comprehensive evaluation. Representative Yuki. Uh, Madam Chair, why I understand that you may not want to do things that have um, money attached, you should know that PACER was very support of, of the work on training para professionals and making sure they have the needs that they have what they need to work with kids our students with disabilities and then if you look at the language on 160.32 to 161.2 it's a or so you could do or time during the school day to review a student's individual um, IEP or or to be just briefed on the student's specific needs by appropriate staff so um, maybe we can leave that section in there since that doesn't necessarily have to have a dollar amount in there. Representative Sandsteed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was actually going to ask if PACER had weighed in on the uh, training of the paras, and I think that question was already answered. I can't imagine that they would stand in opposition to that. The other question I have is in the Senate language, line 80.2, it says the individualized education program may report the student's performance on general state or district-wide assessments related to the student's educational needs. Why would we put all this effort, time, money into um, a program and then not report the data? Senator Nelson. And uh, where is that language? Uh, Line 80.2 in the start, Senate starts language. on 80.1, but the meat is 80.2. I'm wondering why we have may versus must. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, uh, so Senator that, Nelson. thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, so that it is an option, again, um, local control that they may report. Uh, we tried to stay away from mandates to our school districts uh, in the Senate bill. Reverend Sandsteed? No? All right. Uh, Mr. Arneson, uh, the second bullet under the Article 4, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the second bullet is on page R16 of that same article. And this is a provision that's in the House side only, but, um, but is complementary to the item that was just under discussion about uh, reporting student assessments on the IEP. And uh, House Section 18 on page R16 would direct the Commissioner of Education to amend the rules to clarify that, um, to allow but not require that an IEP program report a student's performance on, on assessments. All right. 
Thank you. Uh, Article 6, Mr. Arneson. Mm -mm. Mr. Chair, Article 6 is the facilities article. The next bullet on the list is on page R3. This is the provision in both bodies relating to uh, school districts entering energy consumption data into the B3 benchmarking program. Mm -hmm. And the Senate recommends adopting Senate Section 5. That seems clear. I trust there are no other questions on that. Uh, Mr. Arneson, Article 7, next final the bullet. The last provision is in the nutrition article, Article 7. <clears throat> on the first page of that article, the Senate recommends adopting Senate Section 1 as amended by the A45 amendment, which I believe members should have. And just in summary, the A45 amendment would require that the the policy that a school, um, that a participant in the school lunch program must adopt must allow a student with an unpaid meal balance to participate in graduation ceremony or other graduation activities. Questions, Representative Youth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for adding a little bit more to this, Madam Chair. My question more would be more clarifying. Um, could you tell me what the heartburn is a little bit on section C, D, E, and F? Oh, I see C, you, you just mentioned, you change it. So our house language C, the policy must address whether the participant uses a collection agency to collect unpaid school meal debt. Um, is there a reason why you're concerned about us letting parents know that a school district would be using a collection agency? Sir, no. Chair, uh, actually, the Senate does address that line uh, one uh, page, line one thirteen point sixteen uh, through seventeen and eighteen. It does talk about the policy must be in writing and clearly commu communicate student meal charges when payment cannot be collected at the point of service, um, and then the um, policy must be reasonable, well defined, and maintain the dignity of students by prohibiting lunch shame. So the the policy that um, the Senate is requiring, again, is locally determined uh, rather than a mandate. As I said, the Senate worked very hard not to put additional mandates on our schools. Uh, we do believe the Minnesota School Board Association has a number of model policies, but of course we wanted to make sure that um, there was a local control in how to maintain the dignity of every student by prohibiting lunch shaming. Uh, and so that is the, the intention of the Senate bill. And um, it does not address uh, the particular uh, point C that you've suggested, but it definitely could. And I would think that our uh, school boards uh, would be very much inclined to do that if in fact uh, that were an issue or a concern. So when we go through and we list things, um, you know, kind of reminds me of uh, when I was uh, an eighth grade teacher, had a student who uh, stood on his desk and uh, was uh, throwing airplanes, paper airplanes. Uh, and of course, that's not allowed. And uh, yet um, the, the point that his uh, father made was, well, did you explicitly say that my son cannot stand on his desk and throw paper airplanes. So there are things that we rec that we know that uh, are uh, important, and we try and put those out very uh, very clearly. And what those policies, what the end result of those policies must be, and that's what you see in the Senate language. But sometimes I think in legislation we think we must need to list every little piece and. Uh, in a sense, it could be actually weakening the policy to say, well, you didn't expressly say that this couldn't be done and so, or that this should not be done. So there's nothing in the Senate language that would prohibit a school from adopting uh, what uh, the House has said here is regarding uh, use of a collection agency. Representative Joachim. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Madam Chair, thank you. I don't, I, I'm having a hard time believing setting this simple 
floor would be that much of an issue to make sure parents know if there's a collection agency that's going to come after them. And I think in the other ones about the other two in our section D and E actually talk about making sure kids have food. Um, that they should be served something, and that is not addressed in your language, and that is concerning to me. So I'll just put that out there. Thank Representative you. Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'm wondering, Senator Nelson, did you have a rule that said they couldn't stand on their desk and throw paper? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I quite thank you. Uh, Chair, you no, 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 sorry, <laughs> Senator Nelson. Representative I'm just Erdahl. waiting for the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, by the time a student yep. gets to eighth grade, that is not one of those rules that I had enumerated. Uh, but what was more telling, perhaps, was that the, the father shot, thought it should have been an enumerated rule, um, kind of like uh, running with scissors, you know. But uh, to, to, the, to the question at hand, though, I do want to make sure that uh, the, the House is aware that um, in Minnesota, well, actually, it's federal law, any child who qualifies for free or reduced lunch has a free lunch. So even our children who qualify for free and reduced lunch, uh, they also uh, will have food. So that is the federal law. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I actually did have a serious question there. Oh, excuse oh, me. My, my mistake, state law. State law. Uh, Thank we you already have that state law. You know, Thank my you. concern is that uh, we talk about lunch shaming, and uh, I mean, that's a very important term. I mean, it, it is what this is all about, but how do we, what does lunch shaming mean? I mean, I know the uh, Senator, you're concerned about uh, being too prescriptive here, but, but something that important might mean we don't have a statute that defines it, I don't believe. I don't think that, uh, I, don't, I don't know if the School Board Association uh, has, you know, some type of policy of what it is. Um, and, and so that's why I think that some of these provisions that the House has uh, that explain in more detail what lunch shaming is should be adopted. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And um, I'm wondering if we do have someone from the school boards or the um, uh, school board orgs who might want to address this. Or, uh, 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 Ms. Perra, can you help us with any of the background on the statute? Uh, help us. Um, I, uh, this is not the first year that we've visited on lunch shaming. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I believe much of the language that is in, I can't say exactly what the differences are, but the, the language that is in the House bill pretty closely matched what was in the governor's recommendation and was in the 2018 <coughs> bill. Um, I believe it was a few years ago that the lunch shaming language was added. And I would defer to Mr. Strom, who have a better recollection of, of the year. Um, when the stigma, to, uh, the stigma language was added. Mr. Strong, how's, how's your, your memory? It's in statute or it isn't? There, there is a requirement in statute saying, um, let me see if I can find it here. It said, the, so it's current language that reminders for payment of outstanding uh, student meal balances do not demean or stigmatize any child participating in the school lunch program. That piece is current law. Um, I believe there have been questions about what practices are stigmatizing. Rose Verdal. Um, well, so part of what we're talking about is there, but part of it isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Pinto. I just know that with understanding from Representative Verdal's point that to a certain extent the language in the House and the House version spells out and does def and does provide that definition. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, thank you. Representative Yukin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, sometimes we do have to be a lot better with our definitions, and I think this language does that. And just to clarify, too, um, we have rules around kids that are qualified for free and reduced lunch, but this statute actually, this language actually addresses students that have debt. They might not qualify for free and reduced mm -hmm. lunch. So we want to make sure that even if a student has debt, just make sure that they still get a meal. Because we all know that kids learn better when they're fed and they're ready to be prepared to be at school 
and they have a whole host of other issues that need to be addressed so that they can learn well, and this is just one of them. So I, you know, I will stand by making sure that our kids have food at lunch. Mr. Strom, anything to fill in on timeline? I think was the main question before you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, members, in 2014, uh, in, uh, in the bill that was passed that year, there was uh, uh, in Chapter 312, Article 19, Sections 1 and 2, there was uh, the change that you're speaking of that also included the change for the reduced lunch where the state pays the additional, uh, as members know, there's a 40 cent charge for under federal law for reduced lunch. Uh, students and the uh, uh, the change in that year also included the additional forty cents, so that the reduced lunch were mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. uh, essentially free uh, mm -hmm. on the on the new meals. Thank you, Mr. Strong. Any last uh, questions, clarifying questions before we recess? Seeing none, the uh, committee is. I'm not going to bang the gavel. I've been told not to do that is uh, stands in recess to call the chair. Let's uh, aspirationally 830. Thank you.